Hello, you're watching Betia Ballistics and the 1960s Gyrojet rockets are back. I will tell you all the science behind them and how these new versions try to improve on the original design. I've made this video into a three-part series, all uploaded at the same time, so you can watch the other parts immediately after this one. Now, this script is 20 pages long, so better get the ball rolling. I just want to say that a massive project like this wouldn't have been possible without my Patreon supporters. There are essentially two ways of accelerating a projectile using gas pressure. That of the launch tube, used in firearms and air guns, and that of the rocket. In the first case, gas is contained into a pipe and pushes the projectile down the tube. In the latter, the gas is contained into the projectile and it's released through a nozzle generates a reaction force, and therefore thrust. In guns, thrust is applied to the projectile only inside the barrel, while in rockets, thrust is applied for as long as gas is being vented. As you can imagine, these two differ massively and both have their advantages and disadvantages. For example, you never see payloads being sent to space by means of guns. Rockets allow a much more survivable acceleration, can be staged easily and overall allow reaching a much higher velocity than conventional guns. In weapons, rockets are widely used for carrying heavy payloads that would otherwise cause too much recoil or require too heavy of a weapon system to be used. And this applies to both portable and heavy weapons. If instead there is no warhead involved and the projectile does damage only with its kinetic energy, rockets are very rarely used. In fact, the gyrojet, designed, produced and sold by MBA Associates, is the only example of portable weapon system based solely on the kinetic energy of a rocket. The company was founded in 1960 and went out of business in 1970 and there aren't a lot of original rockets around, so it was definitely time to make some new ones. However, these new ones are modified in an effort to improve on the original design and I want to first show you an original. Unfortunately, even the big warehouse I have access to doesn't have one, so I made this plastic model. Luckily, I've been in touch with Mel Carpenter, author of the book NBA Gyrojets and Other Ordnance, who you see in this picture together with Robert Meinhard, one of the two fathers of the gyrojet. His work is the only comprehensive book on this unique weapon system and thanks to it I can provide you accurate information on the original design. Each rocket was composed of three main parts, a 13mm metal jacket, a solid propellant grain and a nozzle plate. The propellant would burn, producing hot gas, pressurizing the rocket engine. The jacket withstands the pressure while the gas is expelled through the ports on the nozzle plate. These ports, two or more, were angled so that while pushing the rocket forward they would also cause it to spin, providing gyroscopic stability, just like that of a rifle bullet. Now, although their working principle made sense, their actual performance as a weapon was terrible. The first problem was low exit velocity. You see, that same gentle push that makes astronauts comfy means that it takes quite a bit of space for the rocket to gain enough kinetic energy to have some effect. The original gyrojets were practically harmless up until a couple of feet from the pistol muzzle and they would keep accelerating for about 45 feet where burnout occurred and then just proceed like a normal bullet would. The second problem is that at that distance the rockets were so inaccurate that you could barely hit the broadside of a barn. To summarize, the original gyrojets were only effective at distances at which they were miserably inaccurate and needless to say the Space Age rocket pistol ended up being a complete failure. NBA Associates went out of business in 1970 and the gyrojet became a forgotten weapon, quite literally. However, I'm quite convinced that they wouldn't have failed nearly as bad had they properly taken advantage of the benefits of rocket propulsion when designing the launchers that were meant to fire them and tweaked the rockets a bit. And the only real benefit over a conventional cartridge is that rockets are self-sufficient. They don't need strong bolts, barrels or fancy feeding systems, they just need a tube to direct them during the very first instance of acceleration. Using rockets in a magazine-fed pistol is a bit like deciding to walk to work, but while sitting in traffic among cars. You get the worst of both worlds. I think the best platform for launching gyrojets would be a bundle of perforated tubes, with a few rockets stacked one in front of the other at the bottom and electrically ignited. It would have no moving parts and the storage unit would also act as the launching unit. In any case, the rockets should have at the very least 50 centimeters of launch tube in front of them so that they can pick up enough velocity, both for effectiveness and accuracy. So a pistol-sized barrel is certainly not a good choice. With that in mind, Gyrojet 2.0 was born and of course designing the rockets was the most crucial part. Even regarding them, I think the original design was a bit poor, so I did my best to improve it. And here is what I came up with. 
The first thing I did was an increase in size. I went from 13 mm of the original to 19 mm of diameter. That's about the bore of a 12 gauge. When you're unsure about quality, increasing quantity can be an option. But actually, I think this larger size also makes more sense. The original gyrojet tried to replicate the performance of the 45 ACP, trying to replace something that is already working beautifully with something that's far from perfect and has no clear advantage over it is not really a good move. Being able to launch a swarm of 12 gauge slugs without any recoil or having to deal with low capacity magazines seems like a better deal. And that was the idea behind Gyrojet 2.0. The empty rocket weighs about 30 grams, so a little over one ounce, plus 12 grams of KNDX propellant as developed by Richard Naka. It's a relatively low performance choice, but easy to work with and very forgiving. Another problem of the originals was low nozzle area. Essentially, the percentage of the base area occupied by the nozzles was too small. To understand why that is, we need to talk briefly about rocket nozzles. You see, a simple hole makes for a terrible nozzle. What a proper one should do is accelerate the flow to the highest possible velocity so to get more thrust out of the same amount of gas. This means that the nozzle has to have a converging section that leads the gas into the thinner section, called throat, and most importantly, a diverging section after the throat. That's because without a diverging section, the flow can't exceed the speed of sound relative to the nozzle itself, so it only produces a fraction of the ideal thrust. How small this fraction is depends on chamber pressure, but in our case, not using a diverging section would reduce impulse by more than 50% compared to an ideal nozzle. Of course, MBA designers were well aware of that, and the original nozzles were in fact divergent. In this picture from Carpenter's book, you can see both faces of the same nozzle plate, and the difference in size of the ports is clear. It goes from around 0.8mm to over 2mm, which is about right. We see that there is no converging section leading to the throat, but that normally doesn't reduce performance by much, so it was probably an acceptable compromise for manufacturing simplicity. Now, for the same chamber pressure, the larger the throat, the higher the thrust and shorter the burn. Since we want the fastest acceleration possible, a large throat area would be helpful. However, if we do that, more gas is going to flow, so we would also need to increase the burn rate of the propellant. Otherwise, the nozzle would be trying to expel more gas than is being produced, and pressure would drop. Also, we need the nozzle ports to physically fit in the plate. Both these factors pose great limitations to the original design, and are the reason why the throat areas are so small. Their propellant geometry wouldn't have allowed a faster gas production rate, and most of the nozzle plate was already occupied by the primer and the roll crimp, so making larger ports wasn't really feasible. Now let's go to Gyrojet 2.0. It uses a thicker aluminum nozzle plate with two nozzle ports carved in it at an angle, as in the original rockets, shaped so that they form a converging diverging duct of appropriate size and shape. However, the size of the ports relative to the rocket diameter is much larger. The area occupied by the nozzle throats is now 3.5% of the total, more than twice the 1.5% of the original four port gyrojets. This means more power and therefore more energy at close range for a given diameter. Considering that the new rocket is also 90mm instead of 13, the increase in performance is boosted even further. I was of course convinced that I wasn't going to be clever enough to outsmart the countless minds that tried before me, but back then YouTube wasn't a thing, so I still wanted to try my best and document the process for educational and entertainment purposes. Also, I'm aware that this is not the best configuration that I can think of, and certainly not the best configuration possible, but it was the best one I could obtain with my limited mind, budget and resources. We'll talk about improvements later. Now, this rocket is not going anywhere without propellant. Solid propellant is always the right choice when you need high thrust. They are also way simpler, and we know simple is good. However, this doesn't mean that making the actual propellant grain is easy. As I explained in another video, Chemistry doesn't really give you many options when it comes to propellants, so you are really constrained when trying to make a workable and resistant grain. And you really need the grain to be in a very specific shape and not to break in handling or when the motor is burning. That's because to maintain operating pressure, you need a very specific surface area. If it's too big, it will cause an overpressure and possibly destroy the rocket. If it's too small, the motor will underperform badly. The originals used a single tubular grain of double based propellant, which is chemically similar to smokeless powder. It has good mechanical properties, similar to some plastics, has good performance, doesn't make smoke, is readily available, so it seems an easy choice. But the problem is that shaping it into a solid chunk is a colossal pain. 
You can't of course melt it and the only option you have to make a solid chunk of it is by using some sort of solvent, which means shrinkage problems, long processing and drying times and specialized equipment. The gyrojet grains were actually made by turning commercially available sticks of propellant on a lathe, since not even the company had the equipment needed to make the rods from scratch. And although the tubular shape is the simplest and easiest to make, especially on a lathe, it's certainly not the best suited for that particular application. Do you remember when I talked about enlarging the nozzle ports? Doing so would have required a larger burning area, which was simply not possible with a single tubular grain. Gyrojet 2.0 uses a higher surface area design, which is explained in depth in part 3 on my second channel Beyond Ballistics. For now, I think it's time to see some rockets take off, or at least go off. Switch to part 2, it's already uploaded and available just by clicking here or in the link in the pinned comment. Thanks for watching and see you very soon.